Welcome to the Visual K podcast. I'm your host, Frederick, also known as Whirling Black. And with me today, I have your co-host, Alexi. And I'm your podcast producer and editor, James, also known as Plant. And today, to celebrate our first episode, we have a very special guest, the CEO of Rarsat, Matt, also known as Biopanda. Hello. And uh, today's topic is, what is Visual K? But first, before we do that, I figured we would uh, introduce the staff a bit on the podcast. They're some longtime friends of mine. So, uh, Alexi, how did you get into Visual K in the first place? Who I've been doing Visual K now for 15 years. I was first introduced to it on a video gaming site, uh, a Finnish one actually. And uh, there was a thread about Japanese music. And someone had actually linked uh, Despise Ray's Garnet PV there. And unlike with most things, which I get into, I liked it literally from like the first second, just the aesthetic and, and the sound of it. It just spoke to me like straight away. Um, it only took like a week or two before I was playing that shit on my parents' car. Like uh, burning CDs with this by uh, reddish and playing it to my mom was like, well, what do you think? And she was like, um, well, I don't like the screaming, but otherwise it's fine. It was... <laughs> That's such a parent thing to say when they hate something, but they can't bear to make their kids sad. They will just, you know... <laughs> try to find something positive going on oh that's that's nice it's basically <laughs> like putting a uh, drawing on the fridge <laughs> uh, same yeah thing. complimenting so, your child's taste in music <laughs> yeah definitely so how about you james how do you get started um i think i got into visual k about 16 or so years ago and i've always been interested in japan in general and Japanese music in general, so Visual K was just one of the many things I got into around that time. I think the first few Visual K bands I started listening to were uh, Plastic Tree, Caligari, and Kagura, which were either recommended to me by friends or just things I found online randomly. Uh, so you kind of started with very atypical bands from the start. Yeah, 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 I was going to say really eccentric choices. <laughs> yeah, like it's usually not, you know, your children's first vk band kind of it's bro i was not... listening to uncafe like yeah. despois ray <laughs> uh basically like the entryest of the entry level bands that were big in the west in the mid 2000s yeah i mean i think out of the three of them i would say kagura is the most like typical visual k band at least aesthetically um plastic tree and caligari i think you could argue are are pretty like outside of the the main visual case scene um, yeah, i, I think would plastic tree got their start in the visual casing at yeah. least yeah that's sort of yeah, eventually yeah. weird off even though still like i think they're connected through other members and they, and the label and so on they still play uh, a lot of visual k events though which i think is sort of like how they keep inside of the scene like plastic tree do a lot of events with uh the other bigger bands like i've seen them play with lynch and medjibre and stuff like that at times yeah for sure uh but yeah um okay that's very very interesting actually so you two have very different backgrounds in visual k like originally at least yeah. uh okay so uh let's move on to our guest hey matt how did you get into visual k so i've been into visual k for about uh, like 17 18 years now way too long <laughs> <laughs> i i got my start from like when when i was in my freshman year of high school and like being a, a like loser loner hanging out by myself in the cafeteria and like <laughs> someone randomly sit like next to me who is also a loser loner <laughs> sorry if you're listening to this <laughs> Um, he opened but, his trench coat and was like, bro, what is that? <laughs> well, basically, like, we just, like, randomly, like, you know, started up a conversation about, like, if I was into anime or not. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course <laughs> That's I not a compliment, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then, like... But, yeah, like, like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, sorry, you look like someone well, who I likes mean, anime. <laughs> where's the lie? No. <laughs> <laughs> he asked me if I, like, ever listened to, like, any Japanese music, which I had really beyond like you know it's like anime theme songs and stuff at that point and then uh he was talking about like how he was into like japanese metal and visual k so he ended up burning me a like cd with um a bunch of like x japan malice miser and seiki matsu on it so that's that's kind of like where i got my start with those bands and 
basically it was downhill from that point. I assume it was probably transcodes as well. Oh, I'm absolutely, <laughs> sure. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> These were definitely, yeah, like, yeah, coming from like LimeWire, Kazaa, whatever. Pike is hot back that that time. What one twenty one twenty eight kilobits per second? <laughs> oh, dude, that's luxury. Like I had like <laughs> uh, when I first downloaded like Eurogamish's music. I swear it was like ninety six or like sixty four. That's that's the <laughs> ideal one. <laughs> I think uh, sixty four is the old like mobile phone standard. I think like yeah. if you recorded uh, audio on a mobile phone, you would get sixty four kilobits per second audio. Yeah, I think so. It's suitable for, like, voice memos, and beyond that, it sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically you can hear the digital artifacts. Yeah. Like, you can you can, you can hear the, the, the pain in your ear. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I don't know. Still, that story is cool as fuck, though. He's a nice guy. I mean, I hope he was, at least. But Yeah. <laughs> he is. Yeah, yeah, I still talk with him from time did, to did time. He... So. Oh. That, that's why I was like, oh, oh no, it, if you, it, am I going to send him this yeah. podcast? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> is he is he st- is he still an intuitional king? Yeah, yeah, he is. Not not oh, as no, much as, as he was, but you know, still somewhat. Oh. Mm. It's kind of interesting because I always thought you got intuitional K from Sid or something because you always talk about seeing them live. That was, that was the or first band like that I saw live because like oh, it was okay. back in in 2004 when they were the the last minute like special guest at uh, Anime Central. They had, they had originally booked Miyavi, and he, like, you know, noped out at the last second. So they were just, like, scrambling. I'm like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, oh, fuck, we gotta find someone. Yeah, let's just get the biggest band in Visual K. <laughs> That'll be fine. <laughs> well, at, at that time, Sid was an absolute nobody. It's like, they had just started. Oh, yeah, that was that early, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah. when they were actually really good, I, I yeah. thought, the first yeah, album. Yeah, that's when they were, like, really, really still visual at that point. Yeah. Yeah, they still so. probably remember that live. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Maybe I mean uh, it's the only time they played overseas, as far as I know. So like, oh. maybe that is memorable to them. Yeah, I, I think so as well. It's always weird when bands did like one-off shows very early in their career overseas, and then like never again. You kind of have to wonder like, what the hell happened <laughs> during that show? Why did they never come back? Uh, they met the Western fans and were just like, "Nah, we're good." <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I know they they specifically were never invited back. So like, maybe they were like blacklisted by cons. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they there's were... actually stories of the Gazette, uh, actually Rookie specifically, uh, talking about the first EU tour. And he was upset that basically he was asking for food and they brought him a salad. <laughs> and that's probably why they didn't come back to Europe for like almost a decade. <laughs> wow. That's, How dare that's, they? A very, that's a very sort of like not very good reason to come back, I suppose. <laughs> he takes his food seriously. I actually have to use the toilet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Okay. Yeah, we will just wait. It's all right. Yeah. Sure. This is why I went. This is why I went before we started recording. And my bladder is very <laughs> mysterious, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> actually, there is like someone actually in the shower, so I will just fidget around and hold my dick, and otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that okay. works. Uh, okay. So everyone, just be quiet. Let me just check my out. audio real quick. One, two, one, two. All right. <laughs> You good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Frederick, how did you get into Visual K? Uh, yeah, it's actually quite long ago. I'm I'm not exactly sure when I should count from because my first contact with Visual K was back in 2002, but I didn't really have any sort of like context to it at the time because I just had a friend who had some Visual K CDs, so I got into a few bands like Daring Gray and things like that at the time, but. Uh, I would say that my sort of like big exposure to Visual K probably came the year after. So in like 2000, 2003, that's when I tried to find some things online and use the few resources that was available to actually get to know some more bands. Uh, but I would say that my my interest in VK was fairly typical of the time. Like it was... Um, Daring Grey and uh, uh, Hide Solo. I heard Hide Solo before I heard X Japan because this person didn't really care for the kind of metal sound uh, of uh, X but liked Hide's more pop rocky solo stuff. And then uh, uh, after that, I guess I got into like Mook and uh, Despair Ray and all those guys as the years went on. And they became my favorites because they were the most hyped bands in Sweden. So I kind of like fed into what other local people liked. Um, 
so yeah, it's been a it's been a long time, but I didn't really uh, associate much much with the local scene until I started my official K nightclub Club Lunacy uh, about three years ago. So basically, you were the youngest out of us when you got into Visual K because I was like twelve. Uh, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, it was like towards the end of the summer of two thousand and two, the first time I heard it. So I was like eleven and a half, I suppose. Uh, and I, it was also kind of similar to Matt's story. It was a mutual friend who, uh, not a mutual friend of mine and Matt's, but like a, a friend who had an interest in um, anime. And uh, we both liked anime kind of at the time. And uh, then she was kind of like, well, you know, there's these bands, you know, that look like anime guys. <laughs> They're very cool. You know, they have anime hair and stuff. You should check them out. I mean, that's, then she, she, that's fair. Yeah. That's a fair description. They're not wrong. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, to an eleven-year-old, that was like blowing my mind. I thought it was so amazingly cool. Uh, <laughs> I remember the first uh, videos I saw was actually um, uh, what's it called? Uh, there was a, a PV VHS with Deering Gray. So that was the first um, like music videos I saw. It was like uh, "Isle" by Deering Gray, and I was blown away. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. So Duran Gray was one of the first bands you got into. And I think that's actually a, a very typical experience for most VK fans. Like usually their introduction is Duran Gray or like the Gazette. Yeah, or if, if you're older, it's uh, uh, Malice Miser or uh, Hide or X, I would say. Yeah. Maybe Matt knows better because <laughs> I, th- I feel like Matt was, since Matt is a bit older, I think he got into the sort of like more bigger fandom earlier than I did. So. I mean, those were definitely, like, the, the, the big, like, you know, I guess, corner, cornerstone bands of the scene at the time. Like, obviously, there there was, like, a lot of interest in, like, smaller indie bands at the time. But, like, everyone knew, like, that. And, like, most of the friends that I knew, like, had gotten into it through through X Japan or, or Malice Miser. And, and I'm... <laughs> I'm gonna like pronounce their name multiple different ways throughout the episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, trust me, we know. <laughs> M- Malice Mazir. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of trouble with that too. When we were discussing yeah. Malice Mazir. We decided Malice Mazir is the most reasonable pronunciation. Yeah, we we, we decided on the uh, yeah on Malice Mazir because it's like uh, a sort of like version of like Malice and Misery. So <laughs> that makes sense. And Misser, Misery, yeah. Um, I think as a Western fan, it's usually you'll find the most popular Visual K bands first. Because like you said, like I don't think there was a lot of focus on uh, indie bands back then. But that was also just because like the internet wasn't what it is today. It was a lot harder to find information on uh, indie bands. So mostly like the, the really big names surfaced for us on the West in, in uh, Western communities. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, like, at that point, like, Live Journal hadn't even, like, really started to become a thing. So, like, oh, all yeah, you had Live were, like, Journal. a couple little, like, random fan sites, and that's about it. So, like, the, your exposure is basically finding a fan site, and then you know, like, you know, whatever their scope of fans is, and that's about it. Yeah, totally. Batsu might have been around at that point? I don't know when they started. Uh, but uh, Batsu started in 2003, I believe, as far as I remember. Uh, but yeah, and I think that you, the fan sites also had this interesting network, like they had some kind of affiliates page where you could like find affiliated fan sites for other bands. Sometimes. Yeah, like the, your Visual K web uh, ring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, it's like a crime ring except for Visual <laughs> K. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and I mean, sometimes I think even the fan sites had like really low quality MP3s you could download. Oh yeah, it was it was the wild west back then. Like you, you definitely had like the uh, <laughs> sort of like weekly music that they would post up or monthly in some sites. Was you know. Yeah, and it was like you directly hosted on the website, and no one complained. Yeah, and you just get yeah. like you know one or two like random songs with no context, just like you know, you know here's a, a Kagero song, cool. What's the name? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I gotta say that it's a, a very different time now because even I remember back in like 2008 when I discovered Blogspots mm. and I had like uh, friends from the local scene and uh, they didn't even really know how to get this stuff. They knew LimeWire and VenomX, but they didn't really know that you could get full albums somewhere. So. <laughs> 
when I was listening to like you know full albums on Last FM or something, they would send me like a message like, "Oh, where did you get that?" And then when I introduced them to Blogspot, so <laughs> minds would be blown. And these days, the kids have everything from BK.gy to basically like almost YouTube. like the entire their taste is already curated for them. You know, there's so much on Spotify nowadays that like you you can do everything completely legal, 100 percent, you know, above the books nowadays, and like basically get a, a access to like a huge swath of vk where like before yeah, there's there a With lot less awful options tags <laughs> well it's a trade-off a trade-off <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's absolutely true about the roma G. um but yeah no i'm so jealous of like modern fans of japanese music and especially vk because back then we had to spend like i don't know like 40 dollars shipping ordering <laughs> it from like um amazon japan or uh what were the other ones like uh cd japan was the one i used uh, most cd japan yeah cd japan yeah yeah buying a, a single for like 40 one. or 50 dollars uh especially when you're a teenager <laughs> not great <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah you spend like y- your life savings on one <laughs> cd or you could be like a real weeb and go to your local record shops which would have like stuff put out by gunshin and were there some others if i honestly don't Europe. remember but <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Uh, I guess yeah. we we had hot topic. Yeah, ga- you can go to hot topic and get uh, during gray. gray. I think that's, that's all they had. <laughs> shock <clears throat> like twenty dollars shocks magazines and during gray, or Cure. I guess it was Cure magazines. Uh, oh, oh yeah. I remember getting the. I think yeah, actually it was Cure as well here. Yeah, it was Cure as well here. I got them for like twenty five dollars <laughs> approximately for one. And, I mean, it was just insane how much they charged. I mean, there was no CD or no poster or anything. It was just um, just a, a magazine that you couldn't read. And you paid uh, $25 for it. Oh, we have a record shop, which is called the Record Store X. And they would import some CDs. And the prices for those were insane. Uh, basically, the lowest they would go for would be like 38 euros. But it would go up to 119 for just some like random single. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I mean, some people <laughs> bought it, I'm sure. There's people who order from fucking... Um, What's the discover <laughs> Japan? Japan discoveries, Japan yeah. Discoveries, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, they they they're quite overpriced. So if right. you <laughs> even get your stuff, <laughs> we're not gonna get them as a sponsor, are we? <laughs> no. Dude, I ordered something yeah, from but... there from like, like way 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 back, and it's the only place I ever sent an email about like, hey, where's my stuff? And literally, the response was like, oh yeah, sorry about that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> Well, I mean, at least they're honest, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I've sometimes had that done, and they have responded like, well, uh, we already sent it out like a week ago, but then I can obviously see on the postage stamp when it arrives that they've sent it out <laughs> after I sent the mail. <laughs> there's, there's, there's some intern in the office just like filing his nails, and it was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's one thing I can say though about like the bigger sites like CD Japan and such back in the day that they they were quite reliable in terms of actually getting your stuff. Like I never got any orders lost or anything from them. Um, but obviously it was way too expensive. So I'm glad we have Rare Sat these days for all your official K needs. <laughs> absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, nice box. Absolutely. Nice, nice fit in in there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, to be honest, I think Rarsat is the only place that actually matches the prices in Japan quite well. We, we like try our best. The street, <laughs> the street prices for used stuff, because you know you can see people on Facebook trying to sell like a set single for like fifty euros. You want to buy my Euro and... press of stacked rubbish for <laughs> I don't know twenty five? <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, a hook you up kind of with this translated <laughs> Dragon Ball Z manga. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, that, that's, like, we were just talking last time that we wish that something like Rare Sat had, had existed, like, 15 years ago. It would have been amazing to be able to buy all our shit from a Western seller at that price. I mean, I, I wish it existed too, although, like, my my wallet definitely doesn't. <laughs> like, there's been so many times where it's like, well, you know, I want this, but I don't want to pay the 30 or $40, so I just won't. But uh, I guess not not having that filter in place probably wouldn't have been great. <laughs> yeah, but if you were the store, I mean, you could that is just true. Re- 
or sell it again. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's this uh, poor availability which also created this gigantic drift between the people who actually went to Japan as opposed to the people who didn't. Um, obviously, they had an intimate knowledge of the scene, its vocabulary, and just how things worked in some bands. And especially during the boom years, the Visual K fandom in Europe especially, kind of felt like an extension of the anime culture. It really did. Yeah. I mean, it basically was the same here as well, because, like, well, I mean, it was it was completely interlinked, because, like, if you ever wanted to see a Visual K band live, you know, without going to Japan, it would be at an anime convention. Like, they almost never had, like, standalone concerts. Or if they did, they would disband right after, like this place where I did. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, I feel like in the West, anime is just sort of, like, inseparable from anything Japanese. Like, to someone who's just not super into Japanese things or Japanese culture, like, if you mention any interest in, like, Japanese music or Japanese film, you always get the question, like, oh, do you like anime? Like, do you like Dragon Ball or, you know, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, and we did absolutely nothing to change that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a culture. True. I mean... Yeah, I, I, I've been trying to take a stand against that, you know, trying to do my best to differentiate Visual K from anime culture. Like, I I really don't enjoy the whole strange relationship there is between Visual K and anime because it's like fundamentally different things. It's kind of like, you know, if you like, I don't know, Western metal, oh, so you like Donald Duck a lot. It's like, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, it it is different, but like... It, it also is sort of, like, a good bridge, I think, for, like, people getting into Visual K. Because, like, when we as, like, Rareside have, like, done, like, selling booths at conventions, we'd often, like, get people coming up to us who have, like, never heard of Visual K at all. But they'd, like, see, like, oh, you know, this music. Oh, hey, the, you know, oh, this band is that did, like, the theme song for Death Note. Oh, they're a Visual K band? You know, and, like, kind of get into it for that. To, like, you know, bands like Gazette and Nightmare who, like, have done theme songs in anime to kind of like pull over fans and create new fans for Visual K. It's definitely a good gateway drug for sure. Yeah. Uh, and it, it it serves a good purpose for that reason. And I think, but I also think that, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I think we all listen to probably theme songs before we listen to Visual K, I would imagine, because I sure did. Like, not just the ones on like, uh, the Dragon Ball Z, which I showed on TV, and uh, but then also like, uh, for some reason, the fucking dog anime is huge in Finland. It's gigantic. It's called Ginga Nagareboshi something or other. Who knows the full name? I don't. Uh, I don't know. What that is. <laughs> I know Cut what you're talking out. about. <laughs> <laughs> Cut <that laughs> wow, look at this nerd over here. <laughs> okay, I'll start over. Yeah. Uh, I think it's again because both anime and visual K culture in the West are both youth culture. So it's kind of the people are very similar. So naturally they would get into that and they would behave similarly in both fandoms because they're generally of the same age and background. Yeah, and it's also the part of Japanese popular culture that sort of spread to the West, so it makes kind of sense also that it's the two most prevalent parts. Also, sometimes it would be similar companies as well doing both things in the West, like not to mention anime cons, but like magazines and... Yeah, well, I think like we were saying earlier, even like just the visual case styles are pretty anime. Like if you like the way anime characters look, the odds are you will like the way a visual K band looks as well. Yeah, that is true also. I mean, the the visual styles are quite quite similar to each other, at least superficially. Yeah, and I think that raises the question whether the Japanese people think this way. And it was actually interesting when people uncovered uh, how the uh, Tusk from Z Kill, how his look influenced that um, manga character. So there is that sort of like tangible crossover happening between the cultures. I think in Japan there's also like, you know, a, a connection with like doujin culture and stuff because like they don't really exist much nowadays, but like there used to be a decent like scene of like doujinshi and whatnot that was like created about visual K bands. So, like, you have that, like, yeah. interlinking there between, like, you know, anime slash manga culture and Visual K even within the own, their own country. 
Yeah, I mean, it makes sense because, you know, there was also this sort of like, you know, the the fans are, you know, young girls and they like pretty guys. And it's kind of similar to, you know, the the tropes that are going on in like shoyo manga and stuff like that. You know, the guys are being all cute with each other and things like that on stage. And then there like is that. the other side of the coin, which is uh, guys with dumb haircuts. Which is us. <laughs> oh, yes. So many guys have <laughs> well, done like, Man, these dudes are fucking cool. <laughs> I want to wear this belly button shirt and <laughs> micro shorts. Purple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say yeah. that legitimately 50% of the reason how I got into Visual K so hard is because when I saw them, I was like, shit, I want to look like that. I, I think that's that's true. I think that, you know, girls kind of, you know, dream about the guys while the male fans sort of more like to place themselves in the position of the sort of visual K rock star. Yeah, it's the classic rock star thing. I think these days that might be different, but in the early 2000s, I think the majority was that. Although visual K in the West has always attracted like sexual minorities for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. It's alternative, so that makes sense, but... Still, I think we're all attracted to the aesthetic, like anyone who gets into Visual K. Yeah, I mean, that kind of brings us to the point of this podcast pretty well, uh, since we were going to discuss what is Visual K. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did have a topic. Yeah, so I think that kind of fits uh, into the topic of the discussion very well, like what Visual K actually is, because, you know, superficially to a lot of people, Visual K is mainly an aesthetic and not so much a sound. I would say you can't really have a... You can't pinpoint a sound that would fit all Visual K bands or all bands that identify as Visual K. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely not, like, a a singular sound, but due to, like, bands being influenced by other bands that came before them, like, there's definitely, like, a linear progression of, like, okay, you know, Duran Gray was influenced by Kurdo Yume, and, you know, other bands like Vajra was influenced by Duran Gray. So, like, there's a, a link between the sounds there, and you can kind of follow that a little bit. <laughs> that's a very that's a very um, obscure reference to uh, Vajra. <laughs> I was trying to remember, like, oh, God, oh, God, who do, who do people compare to, to Duran Gray? Uh, uh, Vajra, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The band that released, like, three singles. You didn't even say Grieva, you just went straight <laughs> yeah. for Vajra. Yeah, they had, like, one single in 2011 or something like that. Yeah, but that, that's the only thing they were known for, was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's the Duran Grey copy band. That is true, yeah. <laughs> they were actually not that bad, I like them. I didn't like them back then, but I like them now, I think they're alright. Uh, yeah, for sure, you can climb down that ladder of Visual K lineage from literally every band. If not musically, then at least through their connections to the scene. And you can almost always take it back to, like, ecstasy and free will. Either that or... I mean, you find the way to the sort of, like, punk and uh, metal roots that way. But I would say that the sort of, like, more new wave side of the, like, Origins Official K comes from, like, a different angle. Uh, like, um, you know, like Booktick, for example, who became one of the biggest Visual K bands, they were originally more of a new wave band, which sort of just merged into the Visual K scene for some reason. Well, like, there was no Visual K band, like, scene at that point, so, like, they kind of got the opportunity right at the beginning to kind of decide that they were going to be part of it and, and, you know, what would make up Visual K. Yeah, and they had very new wave uh, hairstyles, like uh, the spiky sort of windstruck look that you can see on Kara from uh, Ucho Ten, which is a uh, 80s new wave band. But it's fair to say that uh, new wave has had an influence on Visual K just aesthetically overall. If you think about um, Western bands like Devo and Ucho Ten did this as well, but they wore like uh, jumpsuit uniforms kind of. And uh, you can definitely see that on certain Visual K bands, particularly like the more electronic ones like metronome and i think speaking of metronome actually i think they're like the first band i could think of that did the uniform look i don't know can you guys think of anything from the the late 90s that did uniforms um, not really not that malice Miser did a uniform oh but not not like uh, overalls yeah. though uh, yeah, I just yeah. mean like the jumpsuit style with like the logo on it it's like the same like three colors yeah that's very devo-ish actually good point yeah 
Yeah, and I mean, you also have the angle, like, uh, the new wave angle with, like, uh, Ganiv tools. Uh, uh, the vocalist Full was a big fanboy of uh, David Sylvian from the band Japan. Yeah. And I think that's also a British new wave band, unless I'm mistaken. There is another overall connection, which is to the vocalist of Dead or Alive, who, while not very successful anywhere else, were fucking gigantic in Japan. And um, they're sound and aesthetic influenced many bands sometimes like entirely because like there was a band in like the early 90s called vogue who later yeah. changed the name to new vogue like their vocalist basically was was like you know a, a, a cosplayer of dead or alive <laughs> the eye patch and everything yeah oh he was just pete burns like 2.0 yeah basically yeah and then obviously <laughs> uh penicillin's vocalist as well oh yeah and they had song titles like Dead or Alive, too. I will say on the topic of vocals, um, singing is one of the most distinct qualities of Visual K. Like, if I say this band has Visual K vocals, like, you probably kind of know what I mean. Yeah, that is true. I think there's, I mean, it doesn't, isn't true for all bands, but it's certainly, like, there's certain quality to the vocals that is very common in Visual K, very, you know dramatic or over-the-top vocals is quite common also like big vibratos and things like that yeah absolutely mm, i think uh, you know it's a visual case this collection of different lineages so if we go back to let's say early 80s we got bowie in releasing an album in like 82 from which Baktik then sprang forth then you got the goth scene with bands like madame eduarda uh automod which was named as an influence by Kyoharu, for example, and uh, G. Smith. Uh, then you got the metal side, which is like Saver Tiger, Loudness, and then obviously like New Wave, like Soft Ballet. So you have all these things coming together, sort of in the late 80s, early 90s. And then from that comes something like Lunacy and Kuroyume. Yeah, the thing is that it feels like it was, you know, uh, several different desperate scenes that sort of like joined together through a mutual um, visual medium more than a sound in a sound sense. Because you could definitely tell like from later bands like which lineage they were following, if they were following the sort of like uh, extra pan dead end metal lineage or if, if they were following like the goth post-punk lineage from Lunacy or Kuroyume, or if they were following the new wave lineage from Booktick and those guys. Don't forget the, the pop lineage <laughs> of, of bands like Shazna, who like, you know, like kind of like brown shed and, you know, basically were, were the, the direct influences of, you know, the Osare and Kitagita scenes that's actually something i wanted to ask you if you know that like uh, obviously those other three we have kind of like a sure way of uh, tracking it but like do you know when this sort of like more pop sound came into visual k i mean that's that's like kind of the earliest band that i can think of is is shazna like that really broke it big and like still was considered vk while you know like maintaining this like really upbeat poppy aesthetic i think arguably you could say uh fanatic crisis when they changed their style fanatic crisis that was like 96 97 i think mask was it that late oh yeah, yeah you know yeah and the mask was right, 1997 yeah. i believe but even Shasna started as a very generic visual k band i love their demo like it, i think it's very nice but i think Shasna kind of switched over around like 95 ish maybe mm. yeah i think melty love is from 95 actually uh, yeah, cause I, it might even have been 94. Because I know, I know Lark and Seal, they got their start, you know, earlier in like 1990 or something. But they were also on like the darker side. And I can't remember exactly when they sort of like lightened their image to like a popular one. It was probably yeah, around That would be mid 90s. mid 90s, a little bit after as well. Uh, yeah. Penicillin's Romance, I think, came. Oh my god, that was. 98 was it that was pretty late actually yeah shazna was already like well established by that time yeah yeah i would like to say that matt is actually probably correct and that shazna were the ones who sort of bridged the pop gap first at least in that kind of sense obviously some of the new wave bands had poppy songs but it was from from a different angle and aesthetic they were de definitely like the biggest example at least because i think there was like this term yeah. of, it was like the the four gods of visual k uh, from the 90s, and it was like Malice Mizir, 
might have Fanatic Crisis might have been the other one. Um, Shazna and some other band that I can't remember. Lacrima Christi. Lacrima Christi. That's interesting because they're very sort of don't fit that crowd at all. Similar yeah. to Laroku, they were sort of very. The influences were legitimately stuff like U2, like their sort of, you know, kind of prog rock era. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that uh, uh, Lark and Ciel were also quite early in adopting the pop sound. I would yeah, say for from sure. their sec probably from their second full length album onwards. Yeah, I mean, was... it has shit like Blurry Eyes. That's mm -hmm. all the way in yeah. already. <laughs> uh, their early stuff is darker, but it also has that. Like, honestly, when you listen to something from even Dune, you're like, that sounds like you too. <laughs> but again, they sort of, for example, they did shit together with Kyoharu and Kuroyume. And they were fans of each other. Yeah, exactly. Those really big bands, they sort of all were friends in some capacity, I think. Probably joined together by their love for money. <laughs> <laughs> well, they uh, probably all played together, like, earlier in the day. Because, like, I was looking at, like, old um, schedules, live schedules from, like, uh, Geo back from like 1992, 1993, and you would see all these bands who would like eventually, you know, break out and be, be really big playing like these tiny events with absolute nobodies, but like still like with like I guess somewhat proto VK bands at that time. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine how amazing it must have been to be able to go to these like smaller live houses in the first half of the 90s, like going to Nagoya Music Farm or something and see Kuroyuma and Silver Rose and all those guys playing together. Yeah, for sure. Before they got too big and stopped playing with anyone at all, just did nothing but one-man tours. Yeah, in huge venues and playing not as good songs anymore and stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I don't think Silver Rose ever made it big. I think they sort of like lived and died in the live house circuit. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think it has to be mentioned also that Visual K bands, the early ones, kind of resist the metal label. Yoshiki, most infamously, said that they were not a metal band, despite having Hide and Taiji in the band, who <laughs> very obviously were into metal. But Yoshiki fought that label. Kyoharu did as well. Yeah, I think that Yoshiki said his band was punk. Or yeah, something like yeah, that. he did. The label X Japan as punk, which is ridiculous to anyone who knows what <laughs> punk sounds like. Yeah, I'd say punk is pretty far from Visual K, typically. Well, not really, because like uh, you can hear it in early Lunacy, for example, in the drumming, uh, in tracks like Shade, and uh, they said that they were influenced by bands like Discharge, so like UK eighty two hardcore. Uh -huh. You can you, and you and you can find a lot of like. Uh, pop punk influences in the so-called Oshare bands, as we call it in the West, like Uncafe and Baroque and those guys. You can find some pop punk stuff going on. LMC as well. Yeah, I think some of those might have gotten like their starts and their connections with like the earlier like punk like more more punk than pop punk bands like Kamaitachi and like basically all like uh, the like, yeah. Anarchy Records bands early on. So I think Color even had so, like some that... some punk ish influences yeah, early on. Is... You know, that is very true, actually. I think Free Will in the early days were very punk-influenced label in Yeah, general. definitely. Yeah, and honestly, even... I, I've never... Go on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've never really listened much to the Free Will bands, like the early 90s Free Will bands and 80s ones, so I, I, I'm not an expert on that, but now when you mention it, I, I do believe it was very com punky compared to the Ecstasy bands. Yeah, there were some pretty random bands on Ecstasy as well, I think. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, th I listened to some VA album, which was like all uh, electronic pop music from uh, Ecstasy Records. That was very strange. Um, but yeah, so this kind of leads me into the uh, next thing I wanted to discuss with you guys, and that is how how would you define what makes a band Visual K? Like, wh what are the criteria that to make a band Visual K? I think these days it's obviously the business model. It's so distinct in Visual K, just how they do things, how they you know, organize their finances, what label are they on, where do they perform, how do they perform, and what's their interaction with the fans. Yeah, I was going to say just by association, like if a band performs with a lot of other decidedly Visual K bands, um, I would consider that Visual K, even if they don't have the exact same look or the exact same sound. Yeah, I mean, association is usually how I connect it. But like sometimes you do just kind of have to, I guess get get that sort of like the, the sixth sense that you get as a visual K fan of like, 
what band is or isn't because like when you move outside of like tokyo or osaka to like these small bands from smaller cities they're probably not going to be playing with other visual k bands but you know they they themselves could still be considered visual k so like you can't really go by association so you sort of have to like i don't know look close your eyes and you know look look deep into your, yourself and de- decide whether they're vk or not <laughs> Or, you know, they could just go out, out and, you know, say, hey, we're a VK band. <laughs> I, think it's su- I think it's surprisingly rare that bands actually outright say that they are Visual K. I, think, I feel like it's often just implied. I remember there was some band like Acme or something who was very overt about we are a Visual K band. Yeah. But I wonder if that was just in, as a way to pander to Yeah, Western they have audiences. a foreign manager now. Yeah, they do. They have some f- foreign women, I think, who does their managing. Yeah, who handles their social media accounts as well, like posting memes. Like Japanese people are like <laughs> notoriously <laughs> stiff, so they don't do the stuff at all. And then you got someone like Issei who gets upset over be- <laughs> being in a meme. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But the thing is, like somehow, some way, despite all the sort of hair splitting, it's still like those visual gay bands which are like featured in magazines, for example. Everyone just knows. It's sort of intuitive just because of the sort of associations and connections which each band has. And there is very little crossover in Visual K. They don't really perform at like other scenes events. And those bands that do are very rare and usually then just connected to a metal scene. And those members often had metal connections before becoming Visual K. Yeah, I was going to say that um, to me the most important uh, marker of a Visual K band is their sort of participation in the economics of Visual K. Like, you know, their CDs are sold at stores that are branded Visual K stores like Closet Child or Pure Sound and such things. They perform at events where there are mostly other Visual K bands. And they uh, participate in things like in-store events where, you know, you can take your photos with certain band members and such things. You wouldn't see that in other scenes apart from maybe the idol scene. I feel like the idol scene and the visual case scene have some crossover there where you can, you know, pay money to take a photo with your favorite members and such. Yeah, there's definitely a, a pretty big connection between those two at least as far as like the business model goes like checkies are a big thing in the idol scene multiple types 10 million types for like you know one for each member is a big thing in the the idol scene but like outside of that i think like most normal bands they're they're not out there doing checkies so that's that's probably the the biggest signifier does the band do checkies okay yeah they're vk yeah, could someone also describe what a checky is for listeners who might not know? I'm just very interested <laughs> in how you might. Uh, absolutely, it's like a it's like a small Polaroid photo, usually taken like right before the show. So after the band members like dress up and put on all their makeup and things like that, uh, a manager or another band member will take some uh, Polaroid photos of each band member, and uh, then they would like put all of pol- Polaroids in a box and. And then it's random. You can't see like which member you're getting. And then you pay. Uh, the fan pay uh, usually 500 yen. So about $5 a picture, I suppose. And then they draw one randomly. So it can be quite expensive if they have a favorite member, you know. They might have to buy like 5 or 10 just to get a good one of their favorite member. And then they have paid like, you know, $50, Euro, $50 just like that. Yeah, and they're all uh, completely original too. Like they're all one of a kind. And... I think you can get like personalized messages on them as well. Like they'll write your name on them or something like that if you order them. It, it happens sometimes, usually not if it's at a venue when you buy it. Usually then it's just um, like some checkies are like lucky checkies. So they might be signed or have some short message written by the band member on it. But it's usually not customized except at in-store events and such things. Well, especially now in like the, the, day of, the days of Corona, like... A lot of bands are like selling checkies through their own web shops and whatnot, and a lot of those ones can like offer like customized or you know signed checkies. Yeah, I think that's what I'm thinking of. I've kind of gotten used to the Corona life. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I didn't also remember that some bands like hiked the price on their checky when their fame rose. I think the worst offender I can think of was uh, Medjibray, who towards the end sold their checky at one thousand yen a piece. Which wow. is twice what a normal band would charge. The venue size might have gone down, but the prices didn't. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think it also has to be mentioned uh, the visual K scene's intimate connection with sex industry in Japan and how basically some bands are able to make a living, you know, on the girls. Yeah, well, it's also the connection with like the, the host industry for sure, if nothing else. Like yeah. there's a, a whole subgenre of visual K that's host K. Of just bands that look like, you know, members of host clubs. Sometimes they are member of host clubs as well. <laughs> that too. Yeah, I think it's a pretty common crossover, I suppose, especially since a lot of bandmen also, you know, get money for accompanying girls and such. I wouldn't call it like sex trade or anything like that. I think that's a bit uh, too assumptuous, but at least they get paid for their company and their time for sure. Yeah, and also this is not a new thing. Like Yoshiki, I think, worked in the host industry as well. And some other guys from <laughs> oh, the early wow, scene. Geez. That's that's disturbing. I, I, I can't imagine having to sit with Joshki and drink champagne or something like that. They took the piano out of the club because he just, he just insisted on playing every time he was there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, please, Joshki, please stop playing. For the love of God, stop playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there anything else you guys can think of, like, what defines a band as Visual K? I mean, obviously the looks, but the looks aren't always everything. I mean, there's such a wide variety of looks inside, inside of yeah, Visual Yeah, see, that thing is never uniform, and neither is the sound. Like, they are obviously Visual K traditions, as far as, like, how composing a song and the affinity for solos and a certain type of vocals. But at the same time, it's still a very wide field, which is also constantly changing depending on what's happening in the West. Yeah, I mean, looks are definitely a a definer they can be at some point. Like, if you see a Kote K band, like, you know straight out of the gate, okay, that's a VK band, you know, without any any doubt. But, like, it sort of, like, blares the lines more when you can do, like, the soft visual bands where they could really go either way. They're just, like, you know, some dudes wearing, like, jeans and a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, we have talked a bit about those in the past. I remember Alexi has a name for them. The Leonardo DiCaprio haircut and the <laughs> fucking leather pants. Yeah, I mean, those tie into <laughs> like general pop culture moments in Japan and the fashion there at the time. Visual K kind of used to follow that more, I think, whereas now they've settled more for, to that like outsider, you know, uh, like being in, on, in the fringe. Yeah, I mean, I think that the those sort of soft K bands probably had more commercial success outside of the sort of outcast crowd that today consume most. Yeah, of definitely. Can. I imagine it was more socially, probably more socially acceptable to like you know like late era lunacy or something like that when everyone used to look like you know guys in suits, uh, <laughs> like actors. Yeah, or like uh, like you know, handsome actors or something. Definitely, like definitely that. a lot more socially acceptable than you know, dyeing your hair bright blue and spiking it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I w I was thinking then like we would uh, briefly just I, we kind of touched on this already, but just like where did the inspiration for Visual K come from? Like where we sort of like see where the early bands like got their sound from and looks from and like how it has evolved to today i think visually it's it's fair to say you know traditional japanese theater like kabuki um where it was very you know sensational as far as makeup goes and just you know the visual presentation of the actors um but also i think you could make a good argument that uh visual k bands draw a lot of inspiration from like german expressionism and early um 1900s black and white movies with just you know that style of makeup where they had like you know black lipstick and and um just very sort of defined features on their face for the film yeah i wanted to add also to that what you said about the kabuki and stuff and i think that this is also an important part that uh, like androgynous appearance uh, among men has been like an accepted part of culture in Japan for a very long time. Like it's not considered strange to have men dress as women. Yeah, a lot of visual K bands like they have their their onagata member who's like the the female looking member in the band that definitely has like a direct connection to like kabuki theater. Yeah, exactly. Since onagata is the term used for a man who plays uh, a female part in kabuki, since yeah. you know. Women aren't allowed to play in kabuki. Yeah, and uh, it's obvious that this is the filter through which Western scenes and fashions are interpreted through. 
So you can at the same time see the domestic influences and then, you know, Western goth and punk and hair metal, glam rock, whatever. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's very interesting, like we mentioned earlier about the sort of like different directions the influences came from. Because, you know, some people always say that X Japan created Visual K. And while they might have sort of like marketed and coined the phrase, I think that their angle is just the one angle that sort of like created an amalgamation of the whole that became Visual K. Because glam metal, glam rock and glam metal isn't all the influences that create Visual K. No, absolutely not. And I think actually X's biggest contribution was not musical, but more Yoshiki's own sort of public persona and identity, which was that sort of romantic uh, <laughs> prince uh, type of a thing, you know, like uh, if you've seen the movie, he goes on about it like he was sort of self-destructive sort of. Yeah, he had this like quintessential rock star uh, lifestyle. Yeah, but he's, he's, he was very feminine in his sort of, I mean, from a Western perspective, just how he looked. But yes, the music yeah. was really fucking hard. And then at the same time, he had like these very traditionally masculine looking members like Taiji. But uh, but I think a lot of bandmen looked to Yoshiki's image and persona and how that sort of built up into the mythos mm-hmm. of the music itself, like the story behind Art of Life and how this dude legitimately got an MRI of his brain <laughs> and put it on as a cover art. I was like, yeah, dude. I mean, that sort of melodramatic, uh, you can't really call it posturing, but you know, that performance, that's essentially Visual K. But then at the same time, like, <laughs> are there any bands that sound like Dahlia? That, that is... No, there isn't. I was going to say that it's actually true, like, uh, the performance art aspect of Visual K, it's something we didn't really mention, but I think that there's a lot of that, you know, like, some bands always stay in character even during interviews. I remember reading some terrible interviews because the bandman used to stay in character all the time as like tragic prince, you know. They they will not mention a single like word about their private life or music creation or anything like that. I think that definitely got its start, you know, with Malice Miser. They were like one of the, the biggest bands early on to really go completely heavy on theatrics. And definitely that extended out into like their interviews and whatnot as well. Because I remember there would be like a lot of old interviews where like the band would all be in costume and whatnot as normal but like mana would never talk during interviews ever like that was kind of his shtick that would extend not only when the band was like having their concerts i don't think he ever did like mcs or anything but he would never talk during interviews as well yeah and i mean visual k definitely is a performance and they usually are playing characters and you can really see this when uh someone in one band will be sort of like a shy awkward type character and then he joins another band and has like a different persona and he's like i don't know super charismatic and and talkative or like you know like a tough guy or something oh i have a actually a very funny uh, story about this that um i think could be mildly offensive to some people if it wasn't in japan but there was this band i liked called uh, rain man and i used to go to a few of their shows and uh, their guitarist uh, spoke in this very sort of like uh, robotic, monotone, and very slow way during uh, MCs. Like he was obviously like imitating how he imagined someone with like really bad autism would talk. And uh, then when I talked to him like off stage, he just talked like a normal person, just per- perfectly normal, like n- nothing. So he just like kind of simulated hardcore autism on stage. Uh, and I think that was just, you know, his character, but I think that's one type of character that probably wouldn't fly very well overseas. That's probably actually another, like, thing that's, like, a defining point, at least of, of 90s Visual K, is, was really, like, pushing boundaries of things and doing things that might not have been considered, like, socially acceptable, more so than, like, any other scene. Obviously, you've got all the bands with the uh, various Nazi, you know, designs or influences in them but like others like lots of like you know gory music videos and things like that that would be considered very like you know shocking or not not culturally acceptable yeah i think that ties in a bit to what james said as well about drawing inspiration from like horror movies and such i think that a lot of pvs have definitely been inspired by that kind of like gore and horror films since it ties in with the there are a lot of cinematic well. pvs such as uh, x japan's endless rain 
which is arguably probably as far as Visual K goes, their most influential track. But the performance also reflected on the egregious amount of fan service, especially on early bands like Bucktick and Derlanger, and the latter especially is notorious for that. Oh, Derlanger, they, they, they were huge into their fan service, probably like the the first Visual K band that really leaned heavily into into fan service. Oh, for sure, and. Uh, it's also interesting because they were kind of a blue collar type of a band. They sounded very hard rock, especially on La Vie and Rose, and especially on their demo from '87, Girl. But then by '90, they already released a very Visual K sounding album in Basilisk. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, Kyo went on to Dying Cries, which is. Well, this is actually a very interesting story, just how experimental they were especially early on. But yeah, I think it's a good good thing to mention uh, Derlanger as well. I butchered that name, but I don't know how it's supposed to be said. Uh, but yeah, because they were also one of those um, bands who sort of came from a more, like you said, hard rock background and then sort of merged into the Visual K. Because um, they, they weren't very similar to a lot of the other bands. Like, you, you couldn't say that they sounded like X, for example. No, I think they were closer to Dead End, actually. Or also, in a way, to Zekiel, who then also in 90 released Close Dance. So you've got a lot of these very influential Visual K albums coming in the year 1990. Yeah, and they were all... Um, I would say that uh, they were all sort of, like, joining together to make that um, scene. And... But what I was kind of curious about was um, how would you guys say that like foreign bands influenced the style and sound of Visual K? Because, you know, some some guys always lift up the foreign influences a lot. So do you guys have any takes on that? I think one very important factor is that Japan might have not have the same CDs available as us in here. And certain bands were extremely popular there while being almost complete nobodies in the West. But from what we can tell from magazine interviews and so on, like there is a few scenes and uh, phenomenons which are obviously dead or alive was mentioned earlier. But then probably Kiss has to be mentioned as one. Um, UK Punk. Even Sex Pistols, I think, to an extent. Obviously, especially the image. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I think Sex Pistols might have made the song that they always play as the encore session during the Ecstasy events. Like the label Ecstasy, when they had their uh, events in the early 90s, they would always end their show. Yeah, they always end with with Anarchy in the UK. Yeah, and isn't that a Sex Pistols song? Yeah, but I think, you know, one of the things like which gets repeated in in the Western community is like, oh, it's like uh, Japanese glam rock. It's... You know, that's a very, very bad oversimplification, I think, because especially these early bands that sort of formulated the visual case sounds like Zekiel and Erlanger, they were already like combining domestic influences, I think. So the Western influences go like years back. Uh, I don't think there was any one single important Western band that had any effect in like the years 89, 90, 91, 92. Yeah, I I would say that the sort of like pure glam rock metal influences pretty much stayed with, you know, loudness and those very early guys. It was vague and discarded quite quickly. You can see that evolution in Dead End, probably the clear like the clearest. Uh, another one is obviously the domestic goth scene, which has some connections, like through Kyoharu, for example, uh, naming um, Jeanne from uh, Automod. But then also, like, he was very influenced by Gastunk. Yeah. Uh, but again, like, goth uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. scene stayed as, a, like, a formative influence. But again, I don't think it influenced any band after 92, for example. No, exactly, because, you know, the like, I, like we talked about earlier, there was, like, different strains of influences. And I feel like the sort of, like, glam rock, glam metal strain were one of the first to die off. Like, I can't really think of any bands post-95 that leaned heavily into this sort of, like, speed metal sound, except maybe, like, Veladonna, which was a very unknown band on Martina. Yeah, it was basically the, the couple bands that, like, wanted to you know, keep on the, the legacy of bands like X-Japan, so you'd have, like, bands like Sadist, who are around, like, the 
late 90s, early 2000s. Like, um... God, I'm trying to remember the name of this band. Uh, Sex something... They had a they had a song called Vagina Fucker. Um, but they were... They, <laughs> anyways, oh, they were, uh, they were I, like, around, like, the mid-2000s, and oh, we're still trying uh, to... Uh, sex Virgin uh, Killers. Yeah, say like a Sex Virgin Killer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You can still put on, like, a random omnibus CD, and you'll find one of those bands coming, like out of nowhere yeah they're still there like hiding in the margins like they're definitely you know more obscure when they do show up yeah i think it's pretty obvious that the sort of uh strain of visual k that was cultivated through the goth and post-punk lens sort of was the one that uh, won out in the end you know with like kuroyuma and Luna C and all those bands yeah, I think if I would honestly have a gun on my head and I would have to pick like the earliest fully formed Visual K tracks, it would be probably something from Lunacy's uh, Lunacy demo, like a song like Nightmare. And that was from 89. And after that, honestly, there wasn't like that much change for a very, very long time. And then obviously uh, when Garnet came and uh, Kuroyume, that's like solidified the whole deal. I have to interject that uh, the Shade demo by Luna C was also from 89. Yeah. And that one is, by the way, an amazing demo tape. A fully yeah. formed band. They could release one of those tracks like three albums later and it sounded fresh. Yeah, that's the track I usually like. If someone asks me, you know, like, what's the definitive Visual K track? Like, the earliest song that has as many of the tropes as possible. I usually pick Shade because it has so many of what became mainstays for a decade later in the scene. Which you can still hear today, but you would struggle to find a band that even sounds like, uh, I don't know, anything from Z Kill, really. <laughs> yeah, that is true. That is true. Well, um, anyway, I think it's about time to start wrapping up this episode. So do you guys have any stuff you want to plug before we finish? Oh, me, me. Uh. Yeah, yeah, please, 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 <laughs> so, please go ahead, Matt. <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll first go ha- go ahead and uh, plug Marisat, since, you know, I, I gotta get gotta get that in again at some point here. So for, for those of us who don't know, Marisat is a US-based Visual K web shop. We sell uh, mostly, like, new and used, more on, on the used side of things, Visual K all around the world. And we just finished up our last unboxing video. We had got it in about uh, a little, I think about about half a ton of of visual K, <laughs> some some insane amount of it. And we're going to be working on planning our next actual auction. Right now, we're looking at May, sometime around like mid to late May for that. So you can check us out at rareshot.net. We're we're on all all social medias. Basically, we don't have a TikTok. But we're on all the rest of them as rare as that, so you can, you know, find us there, find out more about the event and whatnot, and yeah, check us out. And I think the Visual K podcast is also on Twitter. Yeah, follow us at, at the VK podcast on Twitter. Yeah, for more news about uh, future episodes and things like that. Uh, Which we, we intend to make fairly regularly. Yeah, our plan is to release them uh, twice a month. As it stands right now, we're aiming for Sunday releases. So I guess for, uh, Sunday, two weeks from whenever this releases, we will have the next episode out. And naturally, there will be divergent topics with divergent guests. Yeah, we will try to bring on guests as often as possible and cover as much as we can of Visual K and try to bring some fresh angles to new and old topics. Some hot gaijin takes for y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, basically, <laughs> yes, yes. So if you enjoy, you know, uh, three guys mispronouncing Japanese, you come to the right place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all right. Well, uh, bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye-bye. Sayonara. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not going to leave that in. <laughs>